from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. So thank you for coming out today. My name is Amy Stoles, and I'm the Literature Program Officer for the National Endowment for the Arts, or the NEA. Michael Cunningham is, astonishingly, 160 years old. Okay, he doesn't look at or act a day over 50, and no, I don't exactly have hard evidence to back that up, but I tell you, the man, the author, has achieved more than most of us could ever achieve, even in two lifetimes. He holds a BA in literature from Stanford and an MFA in creative writing from the Iowa Writers Workshop. He won a Guggenheim Fellowship in 93, a Whiting Writers Award in 95, and an NEA Fellowship in 98, the year his novel, The Hours, was published by Farrar, Strauss, and Drew, and won him, the following year, a Stonewall or GLBT Book Award, a Penn Faulkner Award, and the Pulitzer Prize in Fiction. I'm sure you're familiar with the novel's adaptation to the screen in 2002. The film got nine Academy Award nominations, including Best Picture, and won Nicole Kidman an Oscar, and Michael, his rightful share of fame. Michael has taught at the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown, Massachusetts, and in the Creative Writing MFA Department at Brooklyn College, and is currently a professor of creative writing at Yale. His stories have been published in such journals as the Paris Review and Atlantic Monthly, and have won him an O. Henry Prize and a slot in the 1989 Best American Short Stories Collection. And in 2008, he received the Fairfax Prize for Lifetime Achievement in the Literary Arts presented annually at George Mason University. His books include five other novels in addition to The Hours, Golden States, A Home at the End of the World, Flesh and Blood, Specimen Days, and his latest novel released last year entitled By Nightfall. With a nod toward Tom Thomas Mann's Death in Venice, By Nightfall tells the story of Peter Harris, an art dealer whose sudden infatuation with his wife's brother turns his seemingly content life upside down. He becomes disillusioned with the contemporary art world. Now, I might say to you as a representative of the NEA, which is all about supporting contemporary art, that if the world were filled with Peter Harris's, we'd be in big trouble. But in fact, we love the Peters of the world. We love those who peek behind the curtain and wrestle with what art really is and who thrive on its beauty as both Peter and Michael do. And by beauty, I mean, quote, the natural human condition, not the rarest of mutations, as Michael writes so eloquently in his novel. Through Peter, and in, lovingly, in lovely rhythmic prose, Michael questions art's purpose, its sexuality, its healing powers, and its tendencies to screw everything up. <laughs> That's really our mission at the NEA, to screw everything up. Okay. Said Michael, writers exist to complicate the world, and we thank him for conquering his extreme old age and coming to DC to complicate ours. Please welcome Michael Cunningham. Thank you for that great introduction. I, I do feel 107. Um, I just have to say, by way of introductory remarks, that I, I, you know, I'm wearing my, this, this author thing that we're all that all the authors, all the people who write, are wearing. I did another thing um, with a number a uh, number of other authors, and we just wore little placards that said talent. <laughs> I've kept it. I wear it sometimes, just <laughs> out for an evening. Um, <clears throat> thank you all for coming. <sighs> well, I have recently decided um, that from now on, for as long as I continue to live and write, and anybody is, is generous enough to come out and hear me read, I want to read brand new stuff. Like, like what I wrote in the hotel room last night. Um, I, if anybody came specifically to hear me read from By Nightfall or, or, or any of my 
published novels, I'll, I'll do private paragraphs in the, in, the, in the back. I don't want anyone to feel disappointed, but you know, I began to, you start to feel like a bit of an act. You, you know, you, you, start, you start to feel like Colonel Cuthbert trotting it out for the 150th time, and it's not that much fun for me after a while, and I began to think, maybe it's not that much fun for the people who are listening. It is actually more interesting to me, and I hope it will be to you, for me to literally be trying stuff out on you. Um, and if, when, if, if, I, if I get to a line or a, a paragraph that seems especially stinky, stand right up and say, cut that out. So I feel like to some degree um, we are together in this. This is, this is a few sections from my new novel, like, like, like half-finished novel, called The Snow Queen. There are something like 150 characters in it, in, in under 200 pages. Um, so I'm just going to read you a few sections about three different characters, um, one of them deceased. <coughs> oh, there's like 17 little bottles of water down here. They take such good care of you here. Um, <coughs> okay, the Snow Queen. The woman's body has been buried in snow for almost a week. She's like a sleeping princess though the snow has brought changes. Her skin is ink blue. Her lips have drawn back from her teeth. One blue-black hand is laid over her breasts and the other covers her throat. She's modest in death, though she was not modest when she was alive. She wears the spangled dress she bought for New Year's Eve, thinking of the midnight kiss and thinking beyond midnight. Only a prince of the dead would kiss her now, and, he, and his kiss would not bring her back to the living, but transport her to the realm of the truly dead. She resides for now in her frozen middle world, sought by a mother and three sisters who insist that she's alive somewhere, that she's run off with that man, and until she is known to be dead, until the few who loved her can see her as dead, she is suspended unliving, but being so desperately imagined as alive, troubled by tiny brain sparks that are not dreams, the dead do not dream, but minute flashes of beingness, like the fleeting lights of fish in deep water that crackle in her ice-cold brain and will not cease until she is found. It's snowing in Tyler's bedroom. Flakes of wind-blown snow, tough little pellets, more orb than flake, more gray than white in the dimness of the room, swirl onto the floorboards and the foot of the bed. Tyler awakens from a dream, which dissolves instantly, leaving only a sensation of queasy and peevish joy. When he opens his eyes, it seems for a moment that the skeins of snow blowing around the room are part of his dream, that they are a manifestation of an icy and divine mercy. But it is, in fact, the snow blowing in through the window he and Beth left open last night. Beth sleeps curled into the circle with his arm. He gently dis disengages himself, gets up to close the window, walking barefoot across his snow-sparkled spark floor, doing what needs to be done. This is satisfying. <clears throat> he imagines, <clears throat> he is, imagine, the sensible one. Beth, if she woke, would, in all likelihood, ask him to leave the window open. He shuts the window with effort. Everything in this apartment is warped. A marble dropped in the middle of the living room would roll right out the front door and stands watching the snowflakes <clears throat> hurl themselves against the glass. It's barely six o'clock, and already kids are sliding down the snow pile that have, been <coughs> that have been plowed to the edges of the parking lot outside, where they've solidified into miniature gray mountains, which, over the past days, have been increasingly ridged and studded here and there with the pure, 
coal black. That, that must be, mustn't it, the New York air frozen into visibility. But now they're white again, white for the next few hours anyway. And kids are sledding over the thin layer of immaculate sugar, like something out of a goddamn Christmas card. Or rather, like something out of a Christmas card if you focus tightly, shooting only kids and snow, editing out the shit-colored brick faces of the project buildings and the still <clears throat> slumbering shop line streets with a neon hue in the liquor store sign winks and buzzes like a distress flare. Still, there's a gaunt beauty in it, a sense of compromised but still living hope. Even in Bushwick, there's still new snow and kids to exult in it. When you live in certain places in a certain way, you'd better learn to praise the small felicities. This is part of the praise project. When Tyler turned 40, he, he resolved <clears throat> to find something to adore every waking hour for the rest of his life. He has since scaled it back a little. He now strives to adore something once a day. Maybe because it's been snowing in his bedroom, Tyler is abruptly aware of himself standing naked at a window, watching children sledding down the mini bergs in the parking lot. He didn't expect to be a scrawny guy with an incipient belly, not yet old, but no longer young, living in eroticized chastity with his dying girlfriend. The train seems to have stopped, for now at least, at a strange and remote destination, not the one he thought of as his station when he boarded years and years ago. He gets back into bed, strokes the blades of, of Beth's frail back. Here she is, frowning over a dream, a great beauty to Tyler, even if she looks ravaged and ragged to almost everyone else. It's easier to forget about her illness when she's awake. In sleep, it's almost impossible not to imagine her laid out, perfect as a wax copy, absent but corporeal, still someone until she becomes a memory. He's already practicing remembering her. They'll be married in a week. Tyler burrows deeper into the white comforter. Sleep is a tundra a field of bright, featureless snow. He needs to freeze his brain and get to that world of silent snow. The man who killed the woman hasn't, hadn't expected her to be buried so quickly. He laid her out lovingly, like snow white on her bier of glass, expecting her to be found by morning. He loved her. He loves her still. He wanted her to be there, pale and lovely in the dawn, prim as a child, jeweled by snowflakes but not obscured by them. How could he have known there'd be, an, there'd be another foot and a half of snow during the night? He drives by on his way to work to pay homage. It is, of course, a risky thing to do, but she deserves it, and he's never been averse to risks. He pulls into the parking lot, empty at this hour, the children are sliding over the mound in which she lies. He passes through a spasm of rays at the desecration, thinks <clears throat> of leaping, <clears throat> leaping out of his car, all middle-aged menace, and telling the kids to get out of there, but is successful at quelling his urge. It would be a bad idea to draw that kind of attention to himself. She wouldn't want him to. And really, once the rage knot has loosened in his gut, he can see another version of the same scene, one in which she'd be delighted to know the children were playing on her tomb. She was, after all, in love <clears throat> with the noisy chaos of the living world. Um, she was, after all, in love with the noisy chaos of the living world. That was one of her virtues, and it was, of course, in the way of virtues, also her gravest fault. She was too easily made glad. She was like a bird that thrilled to any bright object, a bird that didn't know or care about the difference between diamond and glass. It was an aspect of her wild beauty. It was the reason she'd had to come, to become what she's become. She flew off once too often with a bit of quartz in her beak, exultant, Sure, she was the luckiest creature on earth, 
God's own favorite pet. The children shriek with pleasure, mouths open, that hint of white teeth and dark face. Say it. Tell yourself. She was huge-hearted. She would not mind about this. She would embrace the little girl who's climbed to the apex as about, and is about to slide down again, crowing with the pure delight of being herself right now, a little girl in a red parka, standing on a frozen hillock with another ride ahead of her. Tyler sits in the kitchen, sipping coffee and doing a quick line. He feels raw and startled and virtuous being up at this hour. He's sitting in boxer shorts and a Yale sweatshirt at the table he and Beth found on the street, cloudy gray formica that's chipped away in one corner, a ragged edged gap, the shape of the state of Idaho. When this table was new, <clears throat> people expected domed cities to rise on the ocean floor. They believed that they lived on the brink of a holy and ecstatic conjuring of metal and glass and silent rubberized speed. Taylor has a proper morning buzz from the coffee and the coke. He's moved from the fuzzy anywhere of semi-sleep into joyful clarity. He can see the day ahead, the teaspoonful of time that's been sprinkled into his path. The color of the coming day feels red, a deep garnet red. Nothing gaudy about it, no false cheer, more like the profound blackish red of heart's blood. Good morning, song I wrote last night. Let's see how you are today. So as not to awaken Beth, he <clears throat> leaves his guitar in the corner. He whispers sings a cappella to walk the frozen halls at night, to find you on your throne of ice, to melt this sliver in my heart. Oh, that's not what I came for. No, that's not what I came for. What do you know? It's shit. He pours himself a little more coffee, draws out another line on the tabletop. Maybe he's just not awake enough to be gifted. Maybe one day, and why not today, he'll bust out of his lifelong drowse. Fail. Try again. Fail better. Right? Would sh shiver be better than sliver? To warm this shiver in my heart? Now it stinks. And that repetition at the end, forceful or cheap? Should you try for a half rhyme with heart? Is it cheesy to use the word heart at all? Now name a song in which Dylan used that word. Name a Neil Young. He needs a looser association. Something that implies a man who wants the ice shard to remain in his chest, who's learned to love the sensation of being pierced. All right, sing those first two lines again. Let them open into something better. To walk the frozen halls at night, to find you on your throne of ice. Well, maybe it's not as bad as it sounds this early in the morning. But still, if Tyler were the real thing, <clears throat> if he was meant to do this, wouldn't he have more confidence? Wouldn't he feel guided somehow? Never mind that he's 40 and still playing gigs in bars. He will not come to his senses. That's the siren song of advancing age. And he can't deny the snag in his heart. There's that goddamn word again. He can feel it, an undercurrent in his bloodstream, this urge utterly his own. No one ever said to him, why don't you use your expensive education to write song? Why don't you glow your inheritance sitting in ever smaller rooms, strumming a guitar? It's his open secret, the self inside the self. Secret, because he believes, he does, that he knows within himself a brilliance, or at least a gorgeous clarity that hasn't come out yet. He's still producing approximations, and it tortures him that most people, not Beth, See him as a failure, a middle-aged bar singer with a day job. Mm, that inheritance money went fast enough, didn't it? When he knows, please, God, if you exist, please let me be right about this, that he's still nascent. <clears throat> no prodigy, of course, but the music and the poetry move slowly in him, 
great songs hover over his head. And there are moments, real moments, when he feels certain he can reach them. He can almost literally pull them down out of the air. And he tries. Lord, how he tries. But what descends is never quite it. He gets closer as he ages, but he still bangs up against the crudeness of his brain, that impossible organ that can only manage melt this sliver in my heart. When his blood demands a barb and searing truth, Last reflection. The snow has begun to melt under the white disk of the newly emerged sun. It is imperceptible to everyone except the dead woman along whose blue-black skin a low tingle has commenced. The smallest of sensations, which she does not feel, as ice crystals shift ever so slightly downward. Within the woman's frozen brain, there are fewer and fewer sparks as her mother and sisters begin briefly, on occasion, to cease thinking of her as they abandon not only hope, but the very idea that she might be alive somewhere, as they begin to number her among the dead. She is embarking now on the last period of her transformation. Soon, soon enough, her body will be discovered, thawed, eviscerated by a coroner, <clears throat> consigned to the flames, and reduced to ash, bone shards, and a single fingernail. That will be the end of her. Now, however, she's still whole, still slumbering. Within a few days, she will emerge ravishing by the standards of the dead, but otherwise, according to the more limited lights of the living. Her face, the color of a raven's feathers, her black lips drawn back in a leer, her whitened eyes opalescent in her ebony face, staring straight up, immutable, awed at the winter sun. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, you know, obviously, well, it's a little, it's a little dark for 10 in the morning. Um, I, I, I just don't have comic material for, for early morning. It's funny, I, I'm really just like a barrel of laughs in person, but then I start writing and um, something else happens. Oh, this, this is, as I, as I mentioned, just one of, of many, many strands, this, this, um, this coke head this aging coke head who is trying to write a great song in a tenement apartment overlooking the mound of snow where, where this anonymous woman has been buried. There's no connection between, between the man and, and, and the woman out, outside. Oh, and there is... Um, There's an, there's, an, there's, an old, there's an older woman who can't get rid of the young boy who's in love with her. There is a waiter who has had a vision of holy perfection over Bushwick, which he can't believe and can't deny. And many, let's just say, let's just say there's a lot going on. Um, and I would, you know, my very favorite thing about coming to an event like this is the opportunity to meet and talk to the people who people who read books, people who could be, could be doing anything in the world right now, um, and came here. So please, yes, sir, up front. Oh, where did my, where did your appetite with the book? Good, good. That's the whole point. Uh, yes. When, when, I was, when I was a young, aspiring writer, uh, what writers did I admire most and who were like my, the, the top of my canon? Um, I, I would talk about two different kinds, like, like the writers who were most useful versus the writers who, who, were, who I worshipped. I, un I understand the distinction. Um, you know, I think, I think in the most useful category, I would have to put great artists like 
Flannery O'Connor, uh, Dennis Johnson, uh, a, a, a writer not as much read anymore as she once was and should be again, Jane Ann Phillips. Um, and one of what I used to do is take stories by those writers and, and retype them, word for word, just, just for the exercise of it and, just, and, and to see what it was like to actually type a Dennis Johnson sentence. Um, and to remind myself, this wasn't so, it was just an urge I had. I, I don't know if I was so conscious of it, but to remind myself that these miracles were accomplished using the same ink and paper available to me and and any and anybody else. They were written with ink and paper in room in rooms not unlike mine, which was um, sometimes encouraging and sometimes of course a little discouraging. Um, I love those particular writers, um, especially Johnson and and Jane and Phillips, because um, you know when I was writing goes through periods. Any art, any art form goes through period. And when I was starting, when I was when I was starting to write, it was um, it was all lean, clean, simple declarative sentences. You could you could almost be arrested for using a semicolon. Um, people like Ray Carver were our gods, and and Ray Carver, by the way, remains in my in my heaven. But 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 there were no other gods to speak of, and. Um, when I, I took some, I, I took writing classes, and, and 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 people would kind of hold my stuff up by by you know, like this. And go, well, it's awfully ornamental, don't you think? Like you know, sort of sort of like I had spent my life carving a bird bath and 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 and, and submitted it to the National Gallery as a as a work of art. Um, so it was comforting to know that people like Dennis Johnson and Jane Ann Phillips were unapologetically elaborate and clause written. And then of course, I came upon Virginia Woolf, the most elaborate clause written. You can actually, on, 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 on a page of Virginia Woolf, you could probably extract, oh, two ounces of semicolons. And they're small, two ounces is, you know, two ounces is a lot of semicolons. Um, so I think Virginia Woolf was sort of a transition for, between, for me between the useful and the, and the, and the holy. Um, and you know, do I do I love Joe Joyce and Tolstoy and um, Chekhov and Garcia Marquez and Tolstoy? Yes, yes, they're all in my firmament. I think maybe I worship most. I I I'm most prostrate. Um, at the, I mean, I'm going to take this off because it doesn't say talent. Um, <laughs> would be Gustave Flaubert, most particularly Madame Bovary. Uh, there's this great new translation by the brilliant Lydia Davis, by the way. Because what Flaubert did with Emma Bovary um, was choose in Emma a person of not only very little consequence in the world, but of really no visible virtues of any kind. She's, she's petty and vain. She's not very smart. She is not even a good mother to her child. You really can't look at Emma Bovary and find much to admire. And by paying such careful attention to her, by just looking at her so closely, without ever nicening her up, without ever apologizing for her, without saying, yeah, but th then she saves a dog from drowning, now we can love her again. Um, by simply insisting that she mattered, he made her a great figure of literature. And in so doing, gave us all to know forever that if a shitty little creature like Emma Bovary can be a great figure in literature than anybody can. Then every single person, look around, every single person you can see, if looked at with sufficient penetration by a writer of sufficient genius, and they are quite rare, is in fact 
a monumental figure. And it not only changed literature, I think it changed our perception of the world. I think it changed our sense of humanity, which is a lot for a writer to do in one novel. Please. For this new one? Um, Please use the mic for your okay. question. Oh, the mic, but, I, but I heard it. What, what, gave, what gave me the idea for, the, for, this, for this new one? Um, you know, I, have to, I, I should start by saying that, that most of my novels, and I, this is true of other writers too, um, spring out of fairly almost ludicrously simple ideas, um, which often vanish entirely in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the course of the writing. I mean, The Hours was going to be a, a, a gay version of Mrs. Dalloway. There's a good idea. <laughs> um, so your departure, your departure point very often does and should be either more nor less than the door you walk through to get it to get it into the book. Um, I, um, why not be candid? Um, I have a close friend who um, is a heroin and 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 crack addict, um, and all attempts on the part of those who those of us who love him to get him to do, never mind, or stop or, or do a little less have, have, been, um, have been unsuccessful. Um, and Billy doesn't have, Billy doesn't have a lot of money, obviously, because his habits are expensive and his work history is spotty. Um, and, uh, he called me up. I was I was home alone that I was home alone that night. I could never have invited him over if, if, my, if my boyfriend Teddy was there. But um, he said, "Look, I'm kind of I'm kind of between residences. I got a place tomorrow, but I need a place to crash tonight." And I said, uh, "Sure, okay. I got a friend with me." <laughs> Billy always has a friend with him. Um, and so I said, um, "Okay, like 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 dangerous friend gonna gonna steal things, friend." No, 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 she's a woman, she's sweet, she, you'll love her. Oh, she's dying of cancer. Um, and Billy shows up. He is, by the way, though, um, so worrisome, um, incredibly kind and charismatic and, 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 and handsome. I mean, he, he was uh, Calvin, remember when Calvin Klein was doing, was doing those underwear ads with the, with the, the really like the like early Kate Moss, the really skinny like like long wants. Like, yeah, you know they didn't they didn't like one real heroin addict, so they called me up. Um, they like so he was he was you know he was he was he was the real addict in the Calvin Klein underwear ads. Um, and and he came over with this beautiful girl named Tracy who is dying. Of, of colon and liver cancer. Um, and I had, I had really, I had very mixed feelings about letting him do drugs in the apartment, but I said, okay. Um, and he, and, and, and so there I was. For the first time in my rather sheltered life, um, with Billy and this sweet girl I'd never met before named Tracy, and they were doing heroin. Um, and um, Billy <laughs> said, hey, you might want to write about this someday. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to show you how to make crack. I did learn. I, I don't expect to put it to any, any use, but I could show you how to make crack I could, afterwards if you want to know. Um, Here's the thing. Here's what this whole long story is getting to. Um, I just sort of hung around with him all night because I love Billy, because I didn't want him to be alone with this girl. Um, and 
they took a bath together, and we stayed up, we lit candles and talked, and, and Billy was sitting with Tracy. Um, and she got up, she wandered and looked out, looked at the window, and he said, you know, we're gonna get married. Billy's gay, by the way. I said, really? She said, yeah. I said, why? She said, I love her. And I want her to have married somebody before she dies. And I looked over at Tracy, who was wrapped in a, in a blanket, looking out at the snow, looking more like Anna Karenina than a, than a, than a, than a ravaged, drug addicted girl. And I thought, everything in the world is more complicated than we think. And it is the writer's job, I think, this, I think we mentioned this, to, to, to look for the complications. And all my images of people doing drugs had involved you know, back alleys and rats and, 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 and syringes all over the place. And I don't mean to imply that I think it's a good idea that Billy and Tracy are doing these drugs, but the, the terrible, desolate beauty of that night, the sense of them caring for each other, the sense of, of, of Tracy, who is still with us, but in very bad shape now, high and kind and about to get married to Billy, who just loves her, in a blanket looking out at the snow really stayed with me. And that's a very long answer to a very simple question. That's where this book seems to be coming from. It's about creating and, di and living and dying and snow of all kinds. And we have five minutes, which would be time for one, I don't know, yes, no, or maybe question. Yes, over there. Oh, the, ad the adaptation of evening. How did I find the permission to make such drastic changes? You know, I'm frankly not entirely thrilled with the way evening turned out. Um, it's okay, uh, I mean, uh, th maybe this is just because we always have regrets about everything we do. Um, I, I adapted a lovely novel by a remarkable writer named Susan Minot, and I made a lot of changes, especially to one of the minor characters named Buddy. Um, and one of the things you, I learned from having my own stuff adapted for the movies is you want it transformed. You want to see it rethought, reconfigured by another intelligence for another medium. I, when I was working with David Hare on, on the script for The Hours, I said, please, 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 not a faithful adaptation. David Hare, genius boy, I hereby, I put my hand on his head, give you permission. I, I, I ask that you bring your massive David Hare brain to bear on the story I wrote and retell it for the movies in, in a David Hare way. That's the fun of it, to see it transmogrified. And um, I kind of nervously said to Susan Minot, how do you feel about some changes? And she essentially put her hand on my head and said, honey, go. I, 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 know, I know what this is about. I, I know that every time a story is told in a different way, it needs to mutate and transform. That's the nature of storytelling. That's the nature of books into movies, into operas, into shows and do tale uh, you know I'll, I'll, I'll be telling stories out loud out here out here in the National Mall in a bathrobe in another few years um, <laughs> so it gets to that and they'll be and they'll be very different from the stories I'm telling now and that's the time thank you it's been so lovely to talk to you this has been a presentation of the Library of Congress Visit us at loc.gov.